Well, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, I am a horrible procrastinator. I know that I don't prove. Uh, and so, for the first time, I felt really good about my message, and I, I planned this out, and uh, I actually said, hey, what are you preaching about? And I told her, she's like, oh, I saw it on Facebook. And I was like, well, that sucks. <laughs> um, I hadn't, but I still was planning on preaching because I felt, and I still feel it's a good message, but I was at my birthday dinner Thursday, and Jim messaged me and said, hey, uh, what are you preaching on, and what are your uh, scriptures? And my mind just blanked on scripture. And I, like I said, I memorized this sermon because I was like, I am not going to have a 15-minute sermon this Sunday. <laughs> and, and I was ready, and uh, I just blanked. And so in the time it took me to get home, um, the Lord changed my message again. I, I, it's become a, a running theme, a joke to me, because every time I'm like, well, where did this come from? <laughs> but... Uh, of late, I have been saying, by the grace of God, there go I a lot. And over, you know, when I was younger, I was much like this preacher in the movie, and I still am in a lot of ways. I like to cuss. I like to be violent. But um, the Lord put me here. It's kind of another new thing that, you know, I know that God kind of molds us like clay, and my clay for a while had dried out, and slowly my wife's tears um, have kind of saturated me enough that the Lord has been molding me a little bit more. And I didn't even realize it, um, but I get on to Ashley all the time. She's crying right now. She, she's, she's been crying for a week, and I don't know why. And I'm going to ask. That's between her and the Lord. Something that I think is the most minute thing. And like something that is just nothing to me. Uh, we went to Jake's uh, Spring Fling. He's super excited about it. He was, you know, he still thinks he's the king. He didn't even come close to winning. But he was super excited about it. While we were there, we were uh, we were going through, and I was looking at their silent auction stuff. And on the very end, something we didn't even know was happening. Where each class made this little canvas, and they all put their little thumbprints on it. And before I actually got in there, I had bid on it. And you'd have thought I hung the moon. If you all need romance tips, you know, <laughs> But I, I didn't win it. I up to $105 on this little piece of canvas and still didn't win. Um, and, you know, every, everything was fine. But I realized how much I had softened. And one of the big things that I have softened on um, is giving people second chances. I am horribly judgmental still to this day. Um, but the Lord has, has found it to begin to soften me even more. And, you know, everybody loves a good comeback story. The 90s was riddled with, I mean, I, I can name them, the Big Green, you know, a bunch of ragtag kids who play soccer and win the championship, kids who play football and win the championship, and go on and on. It was it made millions of dollars for Disney. Because we love a comeback story. When, once Kentucky lost this year in the in, in March Madness, everybody became a peacock, right? <laughs> we love the Cinderella story, that comeback, that come from nothing story. In certain settings, but we're all horribly judgmental. The Bible says that we should judge the fruits, not the plan, not the motive, right? But Sometimes every plant has bad fruit, right? If we judge based on one season, we would all fall short, very short. But I had a gentleman I work with, I won't say his name, um, but he, he came and worked for me for three or four hours. And um, the reason was that, you know, he needed to get off for his AA meeting. And I got back. You know, or I got in a little early um, from another, you know, from a class, and I said, hey, you know, you just go on home so you can go to your meeting. He's like, well, good, because I would hate for people to see an ambulance sitting outside of an AA meeting. I said, why? He's like, ah, oh, it just looks bad. And it just hit, hit me. 
it hit me really hard because 10 years ago, maybe, maybe less, I had people in that situation. And, I, and it's, it's so easy. We have a horrible, horrible opiate epidemic in the state of Kentucky. And I see it almost every day. And I beg people to get help. And they, think they, don't, they don't want it or they don't think they can get it. And for a long time I judged those people because I didn't understand them. And then again, Ashley's tears softened me up. Ashley went to school uh, initially to be a substance abuse counselor. She has a heart for those people. And my first experiences with that group, we went to George Washington University. And look at that laugh. We were going to George Washington University. And um, Jake is horrible in the car. He hates to travel. But Ashley, up until the last year, does not fly. And so I do not want to drive in the middle of the day in Washington, D.C. I don't know anybody who does. <laughs> but I come up with this idea, and I'm like, hey, I will drive through the night. Jake can sleep. You can sleep. She says, okay, well, I have this guy going with us. So this, <laughs> this guy... <laughs> Who is uh, you know is a, an addict to me? Like I'm just like he's an addict, and you're gonna put this addict in the car next to me and you know, with our son, and we're gonna drive to Washington D.C. She's like, yep. <laughs> so I drive down to downtown Moorhead, and we pick this guy up, and he looks rough, but I'm sure I did too. It was like 10 o'clock at night, and he gets in, and for eight hours we barely talk, just a little here and there. But through the next three or four days, I got to meet him, and I got to meet another guy, Gene. Now, Gene is an inspiration. He really is. He is a ball of energy. He is bubbly. But he was an addict. And at the time, I just was soured on it. You know, because, again, I see this every day in my job. Addicts are in my head, right? Like, he's just an addict. Later, or later this year, we're going to Gene's wedding. Gene is running for political office. Gene is doing amazing things. And if I had not, if my heart hadn't softened, I wouldn't be a part of that. I would have never seen it. And so God has kind of slowly showed me that he is truly the God of second chances. But not only does he give second chances, but he needs us to allow those second chances as well. So second chances start as early as Genesis. With Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve had one rule. <laughs> but <clears throat> because of that, <clears throat> I look out and there's a. There's a um, <laughs> but we forget really quickly that once this occurred, um, almost immediately, God sacrificed large animals to give them clothing. Even though they had broken his one rule, he immediately gave them clothes. Now if that's not some form of forgiveness, I don't know what it is. He could have left them naked. He could have destroyed them. He had just created the whole world, the universe, the galaxies, the stars, and everything. Less than the blink of an eye to destroy them. And instead, he gave them clothes. Not only that, but he stayed with them for over a millennia by, the, by biblical times, right? If you read over a millennia, he never left them and he never gave up on them. For a millennia. Get my other notes here pulled up. So then we have Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, for 40 years, for 40 years, they got Abraham, it took 40 years for him to fully listen to the Lord. He watched Sodom and Gomorrah be destroyed. And still, even in that, God tried to give favor and allow them to change their ways. And as Abraham prayed and said, if there are just this many, Lord, this is... And he was said, okay, yeah, sure. But when he couldn't find that number, of course, God had to follow through. But it took over 10 years for them to, or 40 years for them to fully listen. Ten chapters of the Bible 
is just about how Abraham and Sarah keep messing up and God keeps finding a way to forgive them and give them a second chance. But my, one of my favorite and is uh, David. David and Manasseh. So David, well, in, in the firehouse, so there's a, a lot of gentlemen who fight church. They just don't want to go. And, you know, I, especially in recent years, have become somewhat of a counselor, even though I don't really want to be. You know, it just kind of falls on my lap. People show up because I, I don't know why. I guess that's a God thing to you all. But they fall on my lap, and I, and I will discuss things. I say, why don't you go to church? Well, if God knows what I've done. That church will burn to the ground the moment I step through the door. I hear it all the time. So I'd like to turn to David. David broke half the ten, right, in one swoop. So if you want to follow around along a little bit, 2 Samuel 11. We're talking about David's adultery with Bathsheba. Um, and so Bathsheba had, uh, was the wife of a soldier who was fighting for David. And while he was away fighting, he notices Bathsheba. And... He, he finds favor on her. and He's like, well, I want this woman. And so he brings her into his house and he beds her and she becomes pregnant. And now David, realizing what he has done, and says, hey bud, listen man, you're doing great work. See the things you're doing. Just wanted to bring you in. And you know, why don't you go see your wife? Because he's hoping that, you know, from the fatigue of war and, you know, he's, you know the, the time they've spent away from one another, that he will go and uh, two-bed his wife and then it can just, you know, be written off as his. But that's not what happened. And said, Uriah said, excuse me, when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the troops were doing. And then he said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and, and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the palace with all to go down to his house. When it was reported to David, Uriah didn't go home. David questioned, haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah said, the ark, Israel, and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How could I enter my house and eat and drink? And sleep with my wife. As surely as you live and by your life, I will not do this. So this guy is so good. is such a good guy. And so humble that he says, I, All my buddies, all my brothers are laying out in an open field in tents. And just because you've called me here, how is it fair? How is it right? How is it fair and lay with my wife and enjoy a roof over my head? Now, to me, there's no way I could smite this guy down at this point, right? Like, how could you do that? But David was not, you know, in his right mind. He, he was, you know, swooned, and he was, he, you know, he was lusting after Bathsheba, and he just didn't see it that way. And so he has to find a way to get rid of him. And so instead of killing him himself... He sends him back to the front lines and he tells him in the worst possible spots you can find. Put him where he needs, you know, the worst possible spot you can find. Knowing that if you put him there, he's probably going to die. And that's what happened. And so then he goes and he gives a little time and he marries Bathsheba. So now he has committed adultery. He has killed a man. He has, well, you know, and in doing that, he coveted another man's wife. And he does all this in one fell swoop. And yet still, after all that, God forgave him and gave him a second chance. Then we look at Manasseh. And it says he was by far the worst descendant of David. By far. Now that's saying a lot. There's a lot of descendants of David. And he was by far the worst. I had not heard of Manessa um, until, you know, Thursday when God laid this message on my heart. Um, and I started looking into it. But Manessa, let me get my 2 Kings 21 is where I'll start right now. It says, 
Judas King Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, imitating the detestable, or the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had disposed. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed, established altars for Baal. Uh, let's see. He built altars in the Lord's temple where the Lord had said, Jerusalem is where I will put my name. He built altars to all the stars in the sky in both courtyards of the Lord's temple, sacrificed his son in the fire, practiced witchcraft and divination, consulted mediums and spirits. He did a huge amount of evil in the Lord's sight, angering him. He set up carved images. I mean, I can just keep, this is, a, you know, a lot of stuff. Manasseh was the worst. Everything in his power to somehow destroy what the Lord had created, to get rid of priests, to tear down the Lord's kingdom. He said, since, and so the Lord said through his servants, since King Manasseh of Judah has committed all these acts, worse evil than the Amorites who preceded him, and by the means of his idols has also caused Judah to sin, this is what the Lord of God says, of Israel says, I am about to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that everyone who hears about it will shudder. I am going to, because of one man and his actions, I am going to bring down such pain and anguish that anyone who even hears about it is just going to shudder. But then, we go on a little further, and if we uh, go to 2 Chronicles 33, from a grimy cell in Babylon, from the floor of a cell in Babylon, Manasseh bows down, puts his head to the ground, and he asks God and to for deliverance. And afterwards, he had a huge revival. So it says, this is 33 verse 10, it says, The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they did listen. So he brought against them the military commanders of the king of Assyria that captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and earnestly humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. He prayed to him, and the Lord was receptive to his prayer. He granted his request. So Manasseh came to know that the Lord is God. And after this, he built the outer wall of the city of David from the west of Gahan in the valley of the entrance of the fish gate. And he brought it around to Ophel, and he heightened it considerably, placed military commanders in it, and fortified the cities of Judah. He then removed the foreign gods and the idols from the Lord's temple, along with all the altars he had built on the mountain of the Lord's temple and in Jerusalem. He threw them outside the city. He built the altar of the Lord and offered fellowship and thank offerings on it. And he told Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Even though Manasseh was the worst of the worst, I mean, it says it. He was the worst. God still forgave him. He got a second chance. And so, no matter what, and, the, and I guess part of the reason this came about was that last week we, we had Easter. And we, we come in and we praise God for his death. And a lot of people kind of forget that the most said he came back. Right? And so, in doing so, in his death, he gave us all a second chance. And so if he was willing, knowing that these things had happened, and knowing exactly the sins that we would commit... If he was willing to give us a second chance, why are we so slow to give those same second chances? Amen. It's very easy for us to judge. Like I said, I'm one of the worst. But open your heart. Don't judge people based on their bad fruits because they've had one bad season. Instead, pray for them. Pray for their second chance. So that you can be a part of that when that good fruit arrives.
So let's pray. Father God, I'd like to thank you today for your second chances. I want to thank you that you gave me a second chance and everyone in this room multiple second chances, Lord. If only we should believe, listen to your word and love one another, we will all continue to receive those second chances, Lord. I ask that you soften our hearts so that we can, instead of judging, Lord, that we can open our hearts to those who need that second chance. Lord, as we go out of here today, I just ask that you be with us and help us to spread that message, Lord, that sometimes we all need a second chance. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Go and be blessed. Sorry I got out here a little late. Don't worry, let me swim.